Welcome to another Splitting Smart webinar um, where Heather and I get to have candid and informative discussions with divorce and well being professionals. Our goal is to provide you with the knowledge on various modalities of support that can help you to unhitch with fewer hitches. After all, knowledge is the antidote <clears throat> to fear, and today's guest brings us a wealth of knowledge on the topic of huge importance, which is preventing health issues, um, how to stay on top of your health and mental health, and how important it is to pay attention to your well-being during super stressful times, especially going through a divorce. So I am Lila Aiken Ali, a divorcee, divorce coach, and the founder of Split FYI. And I'm Heather Steer, a divorcee, a CDFA, a divorce coach, and the co-founder of Split FYI. And um, before we introduce our next guest, we are in a webinar setting. And so people, you're welcome to put Q&A um, or questions in the Q&A section, raise your hand. I can try and call on people. I'm going to be trying to moderate that part as we are um, chatting today. And uh, we'll also leave probably 15 minutes at the end to have uh, more of an open forum if you couldn't kind of cut into um, to our discussion. So without further ado, today's guest is a dear friend of mine, Dr. Georgine Nanos. She's an MD, has a master's in public health, um, and she's also the CEO and medical director for Kind Health Group. Uh, Dr. Nanos believes in listening to each individual story and building a deep personal connection with all of her patients. And she believes it's the best way to get to the root cause of any issues a patient may have. Um, I have personal experience as she has supported me for several years now, particularly after my own divorce and has really been critical in um, helping me to minimize the impact of all of that stress and, and continues to be a good partner um, medically and personally. So thank you for being here, Georgine. I'm so excited. Thank you, Heather, for that lovely introduction. And I should add, I'm also a divorcee. Yes, also a divorcee. We're going to get to that. <laughs> yes, gonna, I was going to say that. So you went through your own divorce. And I'd love if you could share a little bit about your experience with that and some of the, you know, you know, you're obviously surviving and thriving <laughs> after your divorce. So um, a little background would be amazing. Sure. So I got divorced about seven years ago. My, I have two boys. They were six and nine at the time. Uh, it was the worst experience of my life, as I'm sure many of you can relate. Um, I had a very challenging relationship with my ex for several years after we got divorced. I thought there was no way we would ever get past that. And sure enough, seven years later, he and I are friends. We have dinner with the kids at least a couple of times a month. We go to each other's houses. We had Christmas at my house with his girlfriend, my boyfriend, kids. And I would never in a million years have guessed that was going to happen. Um, but if it's possible for me, it's possible for anyone. It was a complete madness. So um, I'm here to give you all hope. <laughs> I love that. I love that. It does, you know, you do forget when you're in those dark days and, and you really don't think that you'll ever get to that point in, in your relationship. So it's, it's great hearing that from uh, someone that you, you can actually end up being friends <laughs> at the end of the day. Yeah, that's a good feeling. And it's, it's so great for, for my kids, especially, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think, um, when you're dealing with a lot of, you know, your ex and, and I experienced throughout leading up to my divorce, through my divorce, a lot of anxiety um, and, you know, some depression. And there was a lot of stress that was caused out of that, which, you know, you helped support me through. Um, and I would love to hear more of your recommendations or share the recommendations on how to help relieve some of those stressors. So, you know, how do you keep your stress levels down? Um, you know, what is it when someone shows up in your office and they're going through that hot mess of a period? Yeah, it is it's certainly, you know, one of the most stressful events in, in someone's life when they're getting divorced. It's, it's like a death. Um, you're grieving the loss of, of a very important relationship. So it's important to give it that recognition. And in doing so, I think it's, it's a great idea to get a great therapist. Don't use your lawyer as your therapist. 
because that's going to be very expensive. Um, and there are lots of resources for great therapists locally. Now with COVID, so many great therapy um, options are available online. Um, and there's a, I've sent a lot of people to betterhelp.com. That's been a huge resource for many. Um, the other really important thing is to give yourself some grace and not be so hard on yourself. Um, practice self-care, do, do things for yourself. Um, I think when women are going through divorce, especially, we have a tremendous sense of guilt, um, guilt for, uh, for the relationship not working out, guilt for our children. And we put that ahead of everything else except ourselves. And we tend to ignore our own, both mental and physical health. So start, you know, if you hadn't been exercising for a while, you know, usually that time leading up to divorce is just complete madness. And so I think focusing on exercise, eating healthier, you know, taking up a new sport, a new hobby, something that's going to give, bring you joy um, is, is really critical in that time. Um, I actually would like to also pipe in because I remember during my divorce and I went through on 10 years in and out of court. So super stressful, like you never saw, thought I'd see the day that I'm actually friends with my ex-husband. So it does happen. And for everybody, it happens at a different time. But I remember that my body was really talking to me and I was totally ignoring it. And so that I ask you, like, there were things that were happening that I'm I, unexplainable, right? Like my stomach would be always bloated. I'd wake up in the morning and I felt like I was actually pregnant and I wasn't pregnant <laughs> because I was just so stressed out. No, really, like it was insane. And I did work out. I tried. I tried to like do the things that, you know, kept me a little bit mentally stable. But I was ignoring a lot of things that were happening in my body. Pains, mm -hmm. you know, all those things that, you know, I think that, and I'm sure you see this when people come to you, it's, and this goes back to how you approach uh, your medical practice, right? It's very holistic. There's right. not one thing, it's the root. So can you explain a little bit about that where, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So there is this very strong connection between our mind and our body. And oftentimes when we're going through tremendous stress that creates a lot of anxiety, our body physically manifests that anxiety. And it tends to show up in about three different areas. Um, people can develop severe headaches, Mm -hmm. extreme fatigue, um, GI distress, like, um, you know, intense diarrhea or constipation, um, cramping, that kind of thing tends to be really common um, as physical manifestations of anxiety. And that doesn't, I mean, that doesn't mean, I think when I say that, sometimes people think I'm saying it's all in your head and that's not at all what we're saying. What that means is that your body is in such a highly um, agitated state that it's trying to give you a signal to say, hey, pay attention. There's something going on here. You need to take better care of yourself. And I mean, certainly when you have uh, any physical symptoms that are of concern, the most important thing is to see your, your primary care doctor or, or a doctor that you trust to make sure that you know, you're having a, a proper evaluation and, and getting to the bottom of what's going on. And that often takes a long time to, I mean, in our traditional medical model, um, this is how I used to practice before I started my new practice, uh, most doctors or, or uh, clinicians will spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes with patients and then kind of move on to the next, seeing 20 to 30 a day. And that's what I had done for a long time, but I really love building relationships with my patients and spending a lot of time with them. And Heather will tell you, most visits in my office last about an hour. So having the space to do that is really unique and special. And so finding, you know, that doesn't exist everywhere, but finding a doctor or someone you can trust that can really give you the space to be heard, I think is, is critical. And feeling heard actually is, is huge. I, you know, I talk to people and they'll say, you know, I'm not, whether it's honestly, it'll be like your attorney, your physician, your therapist. If you're not feeling like they're actually listening and that they're processing what you are telling them, then move on. Like, simply that is not the right fit for you. You are not connecting at a good level and you're not gonna walk out of there feeling any better than when you walked into that office. So 
and it is scary to have to switch positions or you know and re-share your history and go through all of that but it is so worthwhile to find someone that really does care and yeah. you know people like you do exist which is fantastic so yeah that's a hundred percent the case there are lots of providers out there and sometimes it just takes a little bit of digging asking for referrals from friends to find the right fit yeah so i have a question around this it's not an enigma because we all know sleep's really important okay but one of the things as you've gone through divorce you know that kind of with kids and young kids sleep kind of goes out the door <laughs> and it's really yeah. hard to manage that no and really difficult and you know i have i personally had a lot of guilt through it all because i was sitting there saying well i need more sleep but i can't get more sleep because my mind can't get there and you know yeah. it was a constant like i it was a double edged sword because you're sitting there you're trying so hard then yeah. you feel bad and get right so can we talk about like because it is i mean you know you'll hear so many different things but this sleep in health in your part of your health you know regime Give us a little bit of and any insight you can. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to probably tell you things you've already heard about sleep hygiene, which um, helps us uh, create an environment that is conducive to sleep and get our gets our body ready for sleep. And a lot of that goes back. Um, some of it goes back to what we were saying earlier in terms of getting your anxiety in check and finding ways to do that. Um, oftentimes when we can't sleep, it's because our minds are ruminating over all the events of the day, things we have to do, any stressors. So, um, so really the root of it is trying to address that. And that starts with, like, as we were saying before, finding a good therapist, finding ways to let that out. A good exercise program is, is really helpful, at least for me, um, sorry, I'm having an issue with my headphones. Um, for me, that's been, oops, I think I'm muted. Nope, I'm not. <laughs> At least for me, um, having that, um, that outlet is very important. That could be, um, time with your girlfriends, time alone, time doing whatever it is that makes you release some of that pent up energy so that you can sleep more peacefully. Um, journaling is also very helpful, especially before bed. Um, creating a dark, inviting environment, a cool, dark room, um, noise cancellation, something to block everything out. And, um, and if you're going to exercise, it's often better to do it in the morning. If you exercise too late at night, that actually can keep you up. So I do recommend not exercising um, any uh, closer, less than four hours before bedtime. Um, and, and devices. Oh, this is the big thing. So <laughs> this is very hard. I actually put it, I, for the first time this week, I put a limit on my uh, Instagram from my uh, screen time thing where I can only be on Instagram for 30 minutes. Um, and it's actually been really hard, but it's been great. So I think putting devices down, turning off the TV, even if you're just you know, scrolling, innocently scrolling through stuff, we don't realize how, how much stimulus that brings to our brains and just, just keeps our synapses firing and doesn't allow us to really get to a calm state. So meditation is also critical. There are lots of great um, apps for that, calm, headspace. Um, so that's, that's usually what I recommend for most people. Okay. I always recommend. I read before I go to bed. That's a way to, to yes. check me out of everything else. And it's my yes. escape to, to do. So reading, I think helps also. Yes. Are you reading an actual book? No. <laughs> <laughs> I have a Kindle. I have like a. Okay, that's good. Yeah, it's the paper white one. So the it's paper not, white, yes. Okay. Yeah, it's not on my phone or anything. So it's, it okay. is, it's a separate device that is just a book. That's uh, okay. We'll allow yeah. that one. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I, it is one of the hardest things to do. And that's why I brought it up because I think also the guilt around it. And that's what I wanted to, you know, like, it's just going with the flow and, you know, it's okay. I mean, sleep is important, but you, you have, I guess, cut yourself some slack sometimes. I don't know. That's, I wish I had done that. You know, I was like, oh my God, I'm hurting myself more. And you go into the spiral of, you know, those like, <laughs> those that mind, uh, the mind monkeys that start taking over your mind and is like, oh my God. So it becomes even worse. And then you really don't sleep. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yes. 
Yes. And, and there are medication options to help you um, if you're going through a particularly rough time where nothing's working. And again, that's, you know, occasion to speak with your, your primary care provider um, and, and just get some advice around that as well. Yeah. Um, but also, you know, this is, I, I love to sleep. I never get enough of it. And I also like to sleep in, but that never happens. Um, so I work very long hours and I remember when my kids were literal on the weekends it was my only chance to really catch up on sleep, which is of course, totally not healthy. Um, you should be sleeping well all the time, but you know, do as I say, not as I do. And, um, I used to put like a little sign on my door on like Friday and Saturday night, like, please leave mommy alone. Like there's food, you know, where, you know, whatever way I had prepared for food. I'm like, this is where it is. Don't wake me up or, you know, or else. So, and that's okay. <laughs> I think the setting the boundaries is important, even, you know, with your children, and in, there is a lot of guilt around that at first, but it's really important that you are operating from as strong a position as possible, because particularly as you're going through the divorce, you're going to be knocked down kind of oh, constantly, yeah. whether your ex is contacting you or, you know, there is something going on with your kids. I mean, there's just so many places that you can be undermined. So sometimes you have to set those boundaries. And I, I think that's totally okay. Hard to do. Yes, but yeah. totally okay to do. And some people need to hear that for sure. Yes. Um, you have to, you have to put yourself first. Um, I know we say this all the time, but it, it's very important to put yourself first because this is by far the most challenging thing you'll ever go through in your life, you know, short of a, short of a death really of someone close to you. And um, you have to put yourself first to survive. Well, it also manifests in health issues, as mm -hmm. you know, we all know. And I, it really, I, I know that, you know, for a fact, it's um, not uncommon that we hear a lot of people who are going through such a stressful period, like divorce, <laughs> moving death, all those three top, you know, stressors. Afterwards, it's like they find themselves sick or chronically sick or, you know, mm -hmm. because they weren't looking after themselves during right? Or, yes. or they, didn't, they didn't go to see their doctor when they should have gone. You know, I don't so many exactly. Oh my God, I, I really need to go see my doctor. I really need to go see my, <laughs> you know, they'll, they'll keep yeah. saying it, but they don't actually do it. Right, so, right. Yeah. Oh, it's, there's actual statistics on the rate of breast cancer post-divorce for women. I, I was just going to say that. Yes. Ignoring, ignoring your routine screenings, PAPs, mammograms, colonoscopies. Um, those have never been more critical. Like you're, you know, taking care of yourself so that you can be around for your kids has never been more important. Yeah. So um, I want to switch over because you and I had some very honest conversations when I was going back out in the dating world. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. <laughs> Around um, sexual health and protecting yes. yourself and going back in. Cause a lot of us, you know, I hadn't been in the dating world for, I want to say like 17 years or something when I went mm -hmm. through my divorce, 16 years. And so, you know, and it's, it's a, it's a different, it's a different world out there. You know, there's, there's now, STIs rather than when I grew up, they were called STDs. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, what is the current reality that people are faced with? I mean, out in the world these days. So we may call them something different, but they're still the same, it's the same, uh, the same bacteria and, and infections, viruses. So we've got gonorrhea, chlamydia, um, you know, HIV still out there. Everything that you remember is still there and it's probably more fierce than ever. So it's very, very important to use condoms and to have condoms. If you're going to be, if you think you might be in a situation where you're going to be sexually active and sometimes you never know when those situations arise, um, ladies, you have to buy the condoms and have them on hand. So, um, that is, that means that you're taking charge of your health. So, especially if you're in a new relationship. The other thing that a lot of women um, aren't aware of is the HPV vaccine. So HPV, human papillomavirus, is the cause of cervical cancer. And a lot of our young children um, are now being vaccinated for HPV at a young age, anywhere from usually nine up until, well, it was up until 26, but most recently this past year, the guidelines for vaccinating for HPV have gone up to age 45, which is awesome. Oh. 
And so wow. insurance will cover it up to age 45, which a lot of women don't know. So if you are newly out in the dating world, I've been telling people this for years, women, you can get, you can and should get vaccinated for HPV because HPV is sexually transmitted. It, you can't see it. About 80% 80, 80 of the population carries it at some point. It is the most widespread STI. And um, it's very easy to get vaccinated. So at the time when I got divorced, it was not approved for women over 20 or for anyone over 26. And so insurance wouldn't cover it, but I you know, knew about it. And so I ended up get, paying out of pocket to get vaccinated for HPV back then. But now if you're under 45, you, your insurance will cover it. If you're over 45, you have to pay out of pocket for it. But I do strongly recommend it because it is, um, it does prevent cervical cancer. It's, I had a girlfriend from high school that got cervical cancer from HPV. It's very, very serious. I, oh, I yeah. yeah, that's a huge tip on the fact that we can all still get that, yes. whether it's out of pocket, because maybe we're over 45. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what I understand. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, from what I understand also, um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have multiple partners that it, it causes it right like I know a girlfriend of mine who had oh, no. one partner yeah oh all partner. it takes is one partner one takes one partner and this is because a lot of people associated it with that right it's no, like oh yeah partner. so yeah. it's one partner and they never know they're carriers men just no nope. carry <laughs> men have no idea about no that idea. and many other things but yeah <laughs> definitely not that there's no yeah. males on this call, so we can stay. It's okay. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, the, we're having a dog. Um, so it's it's really scary to go back out and be intimate with someone new. And, you know, we're older. Our boobs might be sagging. <laughs> babies, everything feels like it's, you know, kind of dropped. Dropped. <laughs> stretched out. <laughs> um, so what advice do you have? I mean, I know there's, you know, certain Kegel exercises and there's, you know, breast augmentation and things like that. But um, what do you do when you, when, when people come to you and they're, I mean, we're, we're scared. Like that is very intimidating. It is very intimidating. And especially, like you said, if you haven't been out in the dating world for like you and me, 17 years, that's a long time. A lot of things have changed in our bodies. Yep. Um, so uh, again, I think it's important to cut yourself some slack. You're, you know, a mom, you're, a, you're, if you're working, you know, you've got a lot going on, a lot to juggle. It's not like you were when you were in your twenties and thirties. So your body has definitely changed and that's okay. That's normal. It's normal to have some insecurities around that, but it's also important to get past that and love yourself and accept yourself for who you are and know that that confidence is what is projecting that confidence is more important and loving yourself is more important than however your body looks. That's what people are going to see. Um, so that's kind of, I'm going to start with that premise. And, and if you wanted to do, if you wanted to make some changes, um, there are lots of options out there that are safe and non-invasive. A lot of cosmetic procedures have come a very long way. Um, there are many non-invasive procedures, for example, for um, vaginal I don't want to call it rejuvenation because that implies that you're having some kind of surgery. But um, a lot of times as we get older, um, as we get closer to menopause, our levels of estrogen start to drop off and that can cause some dryness in the vaginal area, making sex very painful. Um, and there can be some laxity there as well. And so there are, I own a med spa, Kind Health Group is also a concierge primary care practice and a med spa. And so we have a couple of devices here that we very commonly use um, very frequently when women are going through divorce, they come in for what we call the, uh, the tune-up. Um, and uh, we have a chair that uh, we call it the Kegel chair. You sit on it and it simulates 10,000 Kegel exercises in 30 minutes. And so that helps to tighten everything up, improve orgasms and, um, and help with incontinence as well. So if you're having any issues with uh, leaking urine, when you laugh, cough or sneeze, that is a lifesaver. And then we have another 
device called the Mona Lisa Touch, which is an, more of an internal laser and that helps uh, reverse vaginal dryness for a lot of women. So those are really safe, non-invasive options um, in terms of, of vaginal, I'd call it vaginal restoration. <laughs> <laughs> and then um and then we also have body contouring devices that help um tighten the midsection um your booty thighs arms really whatever you want to work on that's come a long way as well um m sculpt and sculpture um are the devices we use in m tone and those are also non-invasive no surgery so there's so many options out there for for women to feel better, you know, about themselves by changing a couple of things. And, and um, you know, all of that, of course, goes hand in hand with um, diet, exercise, and, you know, mental health support. So, and Botox and fillers always helps too. <laughs> <laughs> they do, they do actually. <laughs> yeah. There is the, the uh, taking the couple years back, you know. Exactly. And is, is always important. What do you think are, um, Kind of the easiest treatments like that are just to feel a little bit younger and brighter i mean there's there's obviously a huge range um but what are some of the just the ones where you look at your patients and immediately people are like whoa that actually like really helped yeah well the easiest well I, the easiest is just a facial i mean if so, there are some women who've never even spent time to on themselves to give them to allow themselves to get a facial or a massage. I mean, that is the simplest thing. So if you haven't done that, do that first. Right. And um and allow yourself some time to just let go and have it just be about you. Um Botox fillers, uh very um, you know, easy, easy to just see an instant result from those. Um, to eliminate wrinkles and fine lines and any deep creases. Um, so that would be probably the easiest starting point for an instant result. Um, we also do radiofrequency microneedling, which is a really awesome treatment. That's probably our most popular, um, if you want to say laser treatment, um, and that creates little punctures throughout the face. It stimula stimulates collagen and elastin and just really refines textural issues. So if you're having issues with um, scarring or, or any, uh, it also firms up the face, especially along the jaw. So it kind of like tightens everything and it tightens and brightens. Exactly. So, so that's a really, that's very popular as well. I love that. I love you said facials too. And it is so true because so many of us, and particularly if, you know, if you are a parent and it goes into that neglect, like, mm -hmm go and do those treatments for yourself. And they make, they, they do make a huge difference just getting the dead skin off. And, um, you know, I always walk out going, Oh, my skin feels so much younger and I haven't, I need yeah. to go do that. It reminds me after summer, <laughs> it's always good time. Me, just sit there and relax and give mm -hmm. yourself some time. Like you said, you know, we, you do tend to forget that yeah. and it, like you actually have nothing else to do because somebody's can't look at your screens. You can't mm -hmm. worry about anything. You can't answer your phone. You know, it's perfect. You're trapped, but in, in, in a beautiful way. <laughs> so yes, I love it. Yeah. Um, well, I think that I, you know, we could go on and on about uh, having, you know, a doctor in the house is, you must get it all the time. <laughs> it's like it's my okay. family, the only yeah. doctor we have in our family gets all the phone calls from everybody. <laughs> so, you know, always <laughs> I'm um, very used to it by now. I've been practicing for 20 years, so yeah, it's exactly. totally fine. You can ask me anything. <laughs> no, it, um, no, but I, it was it, going back to a bit of aesthetics and you know the facial and everything. I think that part of what you said earlier, it's like you know sometimes you have to. There's the mental part that we need to also accept who we are in ourselves, right? And there's an acceptance and understanding that. And a lot of times, you know, when you go through a divorce, even if you're the one who's instigating it, like you said earlier, it's a loss. And you feel like insecure about yourself and you feel like, how am I gonna, you know, all these things that you're going through. Um, but I think, and what I loved about what you said, and this is what I wanna reiterate, is like that little thing of just giving yourself a facial or the little things that you could do, like a Botox, really seriously, like even going yeah. through a little bit of Botox that changes your face. Because when you are so stressed out and you've been like this the whole time or like 
your whole face is showing it. Right. Yeah, yes. exactly. <laughs> like, so you just need to relax. No, honestly. And then, you know, and then go out and have fun and show yourself to the world, right? It's like, a, yes. I don't know, like a, um, it's like when you put some new dress on or something, you know, it's like. Exactly. Yes. Enjoy it. So I think that's uh, really important for women who are going through such a transitional phase in their life and before they're dating again, or even while they're dating. Yeah. So, anytime. Anytime. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm wondering if we have any questions in our. I'm not seeing any in the Q&A right now. Okay. But anyone, you're welcome to chime in with any questions you may have out there. Mm -hmm. This is your chance. <laughs> I know it's so true. Um, one of the other ones that comes up a lot is supplements. Yeah. Which mm -hmm. ones are, you know, I have a teenage daughter that is, you know, all over TikTok being told things to drink <laughs> too. And but and I'm like, chlorophyll. <laughs> like, oh like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> See, I was like, "What? I, this one I have not heard of." Um, yeah, as you say, it, I'll drink it. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's funny. So um, I, I am not a huge fan of supplements because I really believe there's nothing more powerful for your health than what's at the end of your fork. So I think our diets and what we eat is more important than anything. And you cannot substitute the value and the nutrients of real food in a supplement, no matter how hard you try. Um, there are a few, there are a few supplements that I will list off in a second that you can't necessarily get from food in the quantities that you need that I still recommend. But for the most part, even a multivitamin, I don't recommend. I don't take any supplements except for vitamin D. Occasionally I'll take B, a B complex. Um, sometimes fish oil, but I like a lot of fish, so I don't need it. So I recommend that for people who don't, um, who don't necessarily like fish and that's it. Um, so everything else, um, you're really better off focusing on a super healthy diet, a plant-based diet. Um, and you can get all of those nutrients and then some. What about this, you know, because I guess it's all the rage up during COVID and after, you know, post COVID, well, we're not in post COVID, but um, zinc. Yeah, I, I'll take zinc if I, um, if uh, I mean, I don't take it regularly. I take it if I feel a cold coming on, but, um, but I don't, I try to really avoid any extra pills if I don't need them. And, and, and people make the mistake of thinking, Oh, it's just a supplement. It's it's natural. Well, it's not. It's still it's synthesized in a lab somewhere. The right. only thing is, um, you know, the difference with some supplements. Sometimes it can be more dangerous than any prescription medications because they're actually not regulated. I think a lot of people don't know that, so you don't necessarily know what you're getting. Um, you know, yes, it, it it may be it may have like a natural logo on it, but that doesn't mean it's necessarily safe. So. Um, and it's always important to discuss the supplements you're taking with your doctor as well. I have a very um, fascinating story. I have actually a close friend of mine. And if she sees this, she's going to be mad at me for talking about it. But she likes that it's a public service announcement. So she was on Instagram a lot and being fed all these messages about supplements she needed to take. And so she was on something like 20 supplements that she was taking a day and um, she was feeling super stressed out. She's also a divorced mom and, you know, working full time. So she just kept taking more and more supplements. Well, she ended up getting severe liver, uh, liver disease from the supplements. Her body wasn't able to process them. She was in the hospital for almost a week. Um, they, it was just a life-threatening situation. She had hepatitis level um, liver enzymes and had to pretty much detox off all of her supplements and finally got better. That was the cause of her liver injury. So, and I, I see this happen at least a couple of times a year in patients where they are taking so many supplements that they cause damage to themselves. So um, and then what she did is when she started feeling crappy, she actually doubled down and took more, um, and didn't, you know, consult with anybody. Um, and of course I gave her endless crap, but, um, 
after she was better, after she was yeah. better. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so I do think we need to use extreme caution with supplements and really talk about them with your doctor and, and have find a solution that's customizable to what you actually need rather than what like your Instagram influencer is telling you that you need. And that also boils down to, you know, taking the right tests and the blood tests and the blood work right. and really right. figure out what you're lacking and missing. Right. I right. Mean, right. I remember I just self, you know, not from Instagram, but I was like, oh, I think I need some vitamin B. Meanwhile, I just got my blood test back and I was like high doses of vitamin, like I didn't need any vitamin B. Right. right. You know? And I was like, oh, I didn't know that because of course, you know, I just right. thought, oh, I'm kind of sluggish. Let me just do it. I mean, so yeah. it, I think it's really important to your point. Like you should know exactly what your body needs. Don't go and take it from, you know, just because right. you know, those promises. Um, I will say that there was something that really helped me um, during the time of stress uh, when I was going through my divorce and my skin. And so everything, as we were talking about earlier, everything relates into your body, right? Like your skin comes bad, you lose your hair out of stress. I mean, there's a hundred yes. plethora of things that happen. Um, and of course, you don't even have to go to Instagram, but you can see, even on any, you know, social media site or wherever it is, those, you know, they talk about the collagen and all those mm -hmm. things that, you know, that can help you. So A, I would love to know your take on the collagen vitamins. Okay. Um, and B, there was something else that really helped, I thought helped me, and I don't know if it was psychological, but I did start taking algae, like, you know, from proper like algae pills, very mm -hmm. highly sourced. So it was really highly sourced and not forever, but it really helped with my skin. I don't know what it was. And I don't know if it's the B vitamin that's actually in it. That's natural. I don't know, but- those are the two things that I wanted your insight. <laughs> yeah. So if you're taking um, the cellulose pills, you're really, I mean, your body's really digesting them and they're not, they're probably not do, having a major impact on your skin. So I don't necessarily recommend them. They're being filtered out through your liver and your, your body actually, um, restores collagen at the local level. Um, so a lot of the, um, some, if you're doing something topically or a topical procedure, that's more likely to give you a collagen boost than the oral pill. I don't think it's necessarily worth that investment if that's what you're really interested in doing. Um, as far as the algae goes, yes, it could be some of the other um, vitamin compounds in the algae that probably helped you. Um, it probably also, was a good gut probiotic that helps as well. Um, so, and yes, I, I left out probiotics. Probiotics are helpful for um, a lot of people with certain conditions. So I do count those in supplements that are worth taking. Um, but, but yeah, I think, I think focusing on um, a really good diet and, and really consulting with your physician before you start any supplement regimen is really, really critical. Um, especially because a lot of supplements also interact with medications we may already be taking and people aren't aware of that, um, can have pretty dramatic interactions. And oftentimes when, when doctors ask, you know, what, what medicines are you taking or what are you taking? People ignore their supplement list completely. Um, but I always ask very specifically and it's usually like, sorry. People really are taking a lot of supplements. Like I, oh, yeah. I, I do a lot of budget building and understanding of what people are spending their money on. And I, I definitely, I mean, it's a huge budget line item for many people. Yeah. It's a billion, probably trillion dollar industry at this point and highly unregulated, lots of people out there just trying to make a buck. So you have to be very, very careful. I think it's also, I just, it's, I guess the promises that they make and sometimes, you know, you're feeling like, oh God, what else is out there that can happen? And I honestly, going back to the collagen, you know, there's yeah. the bone broth and the collagen. And I mean, I guess eating it and like, drinking it, the bone broth might actually be something that it will. That's great. I highly right. recommend that. Yes. So okay. I just wouldn't take it if you put it in a pill. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and, and no, but that's really interesting because 
what's funny is people will not take the, the soup, but they'll have the pill, but the pill has exactly the same thing. I'm like, that is the bone broth. That is the, you know, whatever beef robot that they're like, no, I can't touch the, <laughs> the soup. Right, right. But, but you have to realize that in order for the pill to exist, there, there is a synthetic process involved yeah. in that. And so you can't ignore that. That's, um, you know, that kind of defeats the whole purpose. Right. It's a little dehydration model that goes on and yeah, better to drink the broth and also get hydrated because hydration yeah, exactly. is actually really key to our health and our skin and everything else. When yeah, you are going through the stress, make sure that you are drinking, you know, enough water because people yes. tend to a start drinking more alcohol, which dehydrates you and you know, coffee. Yes. Keep up, so, yep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Stay awake because we're not yeah. sleeping. It becomes a whole vicious, whole vicious. It, it does. Yes. Yes. I, I live on coffee I learned, and water. <laughs> I learned early on though, um, when I was taking a lot of supplements too, and I was trying to get through all the stressors. Um, and um, I went to see a Chinese doctor and it was actually the Chinese doctor who said, your liver is in danger. It was the Chinese doctor was like, you need, yeah, like you need to, yeah. oh, I'm like, I'm not even drinking because I went through mine during like pregnancy and after pregnancy. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't even drinking. I was like, there's no way. And he's like, no, what are you taking? <laughs> so he yeah. also was saying that that is so to your point and the Chinese yeah. think the same way. Um, <laughs> do not. It, it's scary. I see it all the time. And there's just such a lack of awareness about the impact on, on our bodies from doing that. Yeah. Well, and the, you know, the other thing that happens is, um, you know, people will either lose weight or they'll gain weight, right? Mm -hmm. Like, unfortunately, I'm the one that when I go through stressful times, I gain weight. And then I feel even worse about myself because everyone's like, oh, the divorce diet. And I was like, <laughs> right, that wasn't such a good diet. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'm going to eat my feelings. Instead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's a really, you know, and that also is like really hard on your body and your systems and yeah. your mental health. And I mean, even when you're operating on the other way where you are losing a lot of weight, you know, that also takes a toll on, on your physical well-being. So, I mean, I think either of those extremes is really difficult, but very common. I mean, it's almost very without exception. So. You don't see someone just sort of holding steady. No, never, <laughs> never. Going through this. So it's, it's also a control thing too, you know, especially when you're losing, when you're not eating. So um, it's the one thing you can control. Yeah. I think That's a very good point. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's psychologically, it's kind of, you know, a little bit like that. So yeah, it's, it is a tough one. I mean, it goes all down to the whole holistic approach that we were talking about earlier. And it really isn't yeah. one-sided. You can't go into the doctor and be like, okay, I have this and that's it. Right. Like, oh, right. there's a whole combination going on. Exactly, <laughs> yes. Unpacking that, you know, to find someone like you who can actually really get down to that root and say, all right, it's not just one-sided and you're not just missing this you know, in your, in your diet or your, you know, well, like it's a whole approach and having that is super important. So yeah. Yeah. I think the relationship and the connection with your healthcare provider is really critical. I mean, it, and, and the accountability, you know, like I walk out of Georgine's office and I've got four things I've got to go do that have <laughs> nothing to do with, you know, any sort of, so occasionally it'll be like, here's a temporary fix but you need to get these other things done so that this goes away. Yeah. So sometimes you need, like you were yeah. saying, with, um, you know, sleep medication or whether it's mm -hmm. you know, the emergency kind of anxiety, let's tone that down when it gets really bad on one day, but we're going to watch how frequently you're doing that. And then you need to do these other things, you know, go to therapy, start exercising, um, you know, make sure you're doing things for yourself and, and, to get that other part in, back into control because yeah. that's what's causing it. Um, so yeah, the, the accountability is a big piece. That's, that's definitely something that I focus on a lot in my practice because I know how hard it is to make those behavioral changes. Those are the, that's the hardest thing to change in our lives is our, our own behavior. And so it takes a lot of work. And why well, have a whole team dedicated to um, keeping our patients accountable, Heather will tell yeah. you. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Right. Indeed. <laughs> yeah. 
They contact me a lot. <laughs> they do. Yeah, we, we take a very well. That's the thing too. I right. take a very proactive and uh, approach to healthcare. Um, you know, the current model of medicine and healthcare is really not healthcare; it's disease care. It's a very reactive approach to um, to the human condition. We, all, you know, people only go to the doctor when they're sick. Well, that's just crazy. Um, wouldn't it be better if you could prevent being sick and um, you know, be in contact with your doctor so that you can foresee anything that's coming down the road and, and, and head it off. So the way I approach, um, our, my patients is that we, um, we are in contact with them all the time. We really kind of know a lot about them. In fact, my, my team, I have a health coach on my team and my two assistants, and we meet every week and we talk about every single patient in the practice and what's going on with them that week or upcoming week, what they need, you know, how we can help them best. And it takes a couple hours, but it is the most important meeting of the week because we feel like that's where, that's where we can really, um, you know, help people make progress in whatever they're trying to achieve. And so, um, so that's, that approach really has been very rewarding. And I think the other piece of, of your practice and what people should go out and look for is that it is, I mean, a kind approach, and that's obviously key in your the name of your practice, but um, there isn't judgment. There isn't like, oh, shame on you for gaining weight over COVID or shame on you. Like there's no, there's zero shame in any of it. No and- way, girl. We've all been there. <laughs> Yes. Never. Yes. So that is, um, but I think that that's something like when you walk into your doctor and you're like, oh God, my blood work is not looking amazing right now. Like I need to do some course corrections. It's, I think a lot of people, that's part of the avoidance of, of going and doing the preventive healthcare aspect of things um, is that fear. And you're, you know. you're right. You're right. And um I try to always come from a place of love when I'm talking to my patients or anybody because um, you just never know what people are going through. Everyone, everyone's got their stuff. Everyone's got a lot of craziness going on all the time, especially these this last year and a half, going on two years. I can't believe it. Um, and so you, we need to have compassion and kindness for our all of our um, everyone in our lives because everyone's got, everyone's struggling right now. And uh, more than ever, I think everyone's at maximum capacity for what they can tolerate it. We're all at our collective wits end. Um, So it's very important to have compassion for, for everyone around us in our community, our friends, family. Um, It's, these are very, very hard times for people from every standpoint. Yeah. 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 Very. (laughs) We're all, I mean, yeah, it's, it is, it it is interesting talking, you know, you obviously have a a broad perspective of um, the community because you come into contact with so many people in the community and my kids pediatrician was saying the same thing about, you know, um, kids mental health and what every family is going through and I'm just hearing it so consistently and so everyone does need to just be forgiving and you know, yeah. not let that voice inside your head bring you down and, and be your worst enemy. It should should be your best friend inside your head. You want to make it a, a good place for you to to live. So yes, for and sure. Be proactive about your health. So, you know, go and see your doctor. <laughs> go get the test done that you're supposed to get done. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and exactly. so many people have you avoided it game. during COVID. Yeah. I mean, I think it is time to to catch up on a lot of those tests that you know you did delay. Yeah, especially those um, preventive screenings, they are so important. And I, and I have already seen, you know, cases of breast cancer that could have been avoided because, you know, they, they were delayed because of COVID. So um, same with colon cancer. So it's just really important to stay on top of that. And, you know, if there's anything that is of concern to you physically or emotionally, don't ignore it. It's as Um, it's your body, you have one life and you want to take good care of it. So, um, so please reach out to, to your, your provider. We also do virtual visits. So if you want to see me, you can do that too. Yes. Yeah. We're we're going to put your details in all the show notes, but what is the best way to get in touch with you, your office, right? 
My, yeah, my office through our website, we have a chat feature on there and you can just send a message. It's super simple. Okay, well, we'll put those details in the show notes. Thank you, Georgine. We really thank you. This has been today. so much fun. Thank you yes, so much you. for having me. Good chat. Yeah, honestly, I'm gonna have to come down and see you when I get down to San Diego. Where are you? Yeah. I'm in LA. Oh, okay, awesome. Well, yeah, I would no, love no. to meet you. Yes, for sure. <laughs> Absolutely. We will have a, uh, a hangout when she comes down next, for sure. I like it. 